Yeah, the title of this section is Thanks, Tim. Tim being Englishman Tim Berners-Lee. If you haven't heard of him, we have neither. The web has been the most transformative invention of our time. I use the web to stay connected with my family. I usually use the web to like search for information, like Google. I use it more like business, because I'm like a web developer. I use the web for everything. I think I spend like half of my day on it. In modern times, I don't think there's a single piece of technology that has done more to advance free expression and access to knowledge and democracy than the web. I'm a scientist, so I use the internet to read scientific papers and, and keep up with the news in my field. Our entire business is actually run through the web, so without the internet, uh, we wouldn't be able to function. It's the most important thing right now. If the web goes down, now the world stops, literally. Who invented no the World Wide no Web? Idea. Um, it the was web. someone uh, in the CIA. Oh, shoot, I should know this. I'm a computer science student. Um, Steve? Is his name Steve? No. Bill Gates? <laughs> Al Gore? Siri? I can Google it for you. <laughs> Internet. <Just web. laughs> there are thousands of people who are probably more famous than Tim Berners-Lee. And yet, not one of them has had the impact of Tim Berners-Lee. It says Tim Berners-Lee. Is it Tim Berners-Lee? Tim? No, I um... For what he's created, it's kind of a surprise that we don't know who he is. The fact that they might not have heard of Tim is thanks to Tim. Well, I'm very happy that I'm not, I'm not a household name. I think that must be... Uh, must be really horrible. I am the son of mathematicians. My mother and father were part of a team that programmed the world's first commercial stored program computer, the Manchester University Mark I. I was looking for a job. I saw an advertisement saying, mathematicians required to work on a digital computer in Manchester. And I went to the reference library and found out what a digital computer was. And it was very exciting, because people didn't know anything about computing, didn't know what they would be used for. Well, the thing about a computer that I learned from my parents is that it can do whatever you can imagine. Once you've got a computer, it, what, what, what it does is up to your imagination. So that is the point. But there was this magic threshold when you had a computer. We were very lucky, we had four children. Tim was the first. He was always very curious. When he was about five months, a professional photographer came to the house and the photographer had a, a tripod and lights and wires and Tim was amazed. He was very curious, trying to work out how things went. I suppose as a kid I was, I was a bit geeky, but also like building things. He, he was very useful as the engineer around the house. I had various communications devices, some of which worked more than others. When he was in residence, we had a very good intercom between the top floor and the kitchen. We did feel that we should encourage him in what he wanted to do. We tended to give the children as much freedom as we could to let them follow their bent. The motto was watchful negligence. You keep them safe, but let them discover the world. One day, I found my father reading books on the brain, looking for clues about how to make a computer intuitive. 
able to complete connections as the brain does. Computers were good at logical organizing and processing, but not at random associations. We discussed the point, then I went on to my homework. But the idea stayed with me that computers could be much more powerful if they could be programmed to link otherwise unconnected information. In an extreme view, the world can be seen as only connections. We think of a dictionary as the repository of meaning, but it defines words only in terms of other words. There's really little else to meaning. There are billions of neurons in our brains, but the brain has no knowledge until connections are made between the neurons. What matters is the connections. There were many different people who thought about how you might categorize and link and share information right back to the 19th century. A guy called Paul Otley actually developed this idea of a, a world brain, a place where all the information could be held and you could send in an inquiry and you would get a result thanks to women who would go through the card catalog and find out the answer for you. When you move to the information age, lots of different people were working to develop digital electronic computers. We have a pointing device called a mouse, a standard keyboard, and then I'm going to jump to a link. Ted Nelson came up with the original idea of hypertext, linking information, creating text that would link from one section to another. But it moves through to the development of the internet in the 1960s and then the World Wide Web in 1990s. The web is the user-friendly version of the internet. The internet, the basic underlying network, was too complicated for people. Tim paired away a lot of the complexity and made the internet accessible to everyone. The next computer in which Tim Berners-Lee originally designed the World Wide Web. It looks very boring, it's just a black box. It doesn't say very much about how important and how historic it is, apart from that one little label on the front that says, this machine is a server, do not power it down. And so if somebody had turned off the computer, they would have turned off the World Wide Web, which is just inconceivable to us today. CERN is an international physics lab in Switzerland, built in 54. Twelve countries funded it, and then they said, anybody in the world who wants to do an experiment here, we provide all the facilities. You can do it so long as you can convince us that you can do it. You bring your own equipment, you bring your own brains, and we'll supply everything else you need. I came in as a, uh, as a contract programmer and then became a staff member. He was entirely charming. In our section meetings, we all had to say what we were doing each week and sometimes, and uh, Tim used to give his little presentations. Now, I used to watch this and think, what is actually going on here? What are all the things which he's written which, have not been which, have not got, which are not described by documents which he has also written, which are used by things which are recursively transitive closure of, used by things which are used by anything which I'm relying on? We could never understand what he was talking about. He'd start a sentence, he'd start his thoughts, start a sentence, and then by the time he got uh, first Thursday, his thoughts had gone past that now. So he'd drop the next bit, not tell you what was in the middle, and finish the sentence. Some of his colleagues, some of our friends, used to get bits of paper and hold them up and it would just say, Tim, slow down. Oh, these are, my, these are my people. These are all the people who know to do this when I speak too fast. OK, I will His brain is so peculiarly wired up. It's fabulously wide up, but it's not very common to find people who think kind of, I don't know, all, all at once. So there I was at CERN, a wonderfully creative, wonderfully diverse place. People have come from all over the world. They've come from different universities. And there's no big rules written on the wall at CERN saying you can only use one particular computer. Incompatibility between computers had always been a huge pain in everyone's side. 
At CERN and everywhere else they were used. The computers simply could not communicate with each other. Imagine if you've got power plugs. You're sitting in an office with every power plug is different. OK, <laughs> what's wrong with this picture? So the first thing you do is you make a cable to connect sort of power plug A to power plug C. And then you realize that you need to connect uh, one of the uh, Fs to a G. So after a while, if you were doing this with power plugs, you'd say, you know what? I've had enough of this. I am going to make my own standard power plug, which is going to be very flexible. It's going to do everything I want. And I'm just going to convert all of them to that. Suppose all the information stored on computers everywhere were linked, I thought. Suppose I could program my computer to create a space in which anything could be linked to anything. All the bits of information in every computer in CERN and on the planet would be available to me and anyone else. There would be this single global information space. I would have to create a system with common rules that would be acceptable to everyone. That meant, as close as possible, to no rules at all. The system had to have one other fundamental property. It had to be completely decentralized. That would be the only way a new person from somewhere could start to use it without asking for access from anyone else. Anybody could build a server and put anything on it. He set out to build a platform that would enable people to share and link information. It was specifically designed so that potentially every single piece of information in the world could be represented on the web. Now, that's a big concept. A lot of people heard that and thought it was kind of crazy. I don't think anybody thought it was crazy. You have to understand something before you can say it's crazy. And we never got that far. People, yeah, I think people thought it was interesting. Vague but exciting, dot, dot, dot. Nobody really joined me and said, ooh, 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 ooh let's all code that up. Um, but, you know, before the web, nobody could imagine this. I, I, I don't think I can describe how Tim's mind works. Tim is the most out-of-the-box thinker that, that I've come across, and I've come across quite a lot of out-of-the-box thinkers. So what should I call it? I thought about the information mine, Tim. That would not, not be very good. And uh, mine of information would have been more, also not very, <laughs> sort of sounded pretty egotistical. Uh, put a mesh. No, uh, mesh just sounded too meshy. I put it, I got it out of the mesh. Here's option A, here's option B. What, what do you think, Tim? I mean, they'll always favor option C. <laughs> so I called it the World Wide Web because but that's what it was. It was supposed to be global, and it was supposed to be a web. But we said, Tim, this is crazy because your acronym, the, the shortened form, is three times more syllables than the original. So isn't this a bit, you know, and you can't pronounce it. We can, at a distance, work together and develop documents together without anything uh, impeding us. My first convo, Robert Caillou, uh, with, then became my partner, trying to persuade people to use the web as a resource. In July and August 1991, there were from 10 to 100 hits a day. This was slow progress, but encouraging. Robert Caillou and I forged ahead and showed the web as much as possible. There was no one point when it was clearly going to take off. We never had time to just to, to sit back and say, you know what, I get, you know, I bet this thing's going to take over the planet. <laughs> it just didn't happen. In 1993, I once again graphed the number of people who were accessing the CERN server. It was now taking 10,000 hits a day. The rate was incredible. It's still doubling every three or four months, growing by a factor of 10 every year. Keeping this this young system on track just needed so many different things. What should CERN do about it? And should we start a company? He got CERN to agree that Tim could take all of the intellectual property that, had, that he had built up around the web 
and make it available freely to the world. It meant that people could develop websites freely without thinking about who they had to pay. And probably more importantly, it meant that a whole crop of software companies could develop around the web. These were little startups. They didn't have money to pay big companies licensing fees, but they were on the, the leading edge of really shaping what the web looked like. James Gleick famously called the web the patent that never was. Had Tim wanted to figure out how to commercialize it, there were many off-ramps by which he could have tried to do that, and he resolutely never did. It was an incredibly altruistic decision to make, but I also think it was a very hard-nosed decision to make because he wanted the web to succeed. If Tim hadn't given away the World Wide Web protocols, you wouldn't see nearly the same uptake. Free is pretty hard to argue about. Bob Kahn and I did the same thing. And Tim has said to me that he followed that path, understanding how powerful it had been for the internet and wanted the same effect for the World Wide Web. We are all trying to organize our thoughts. We're all trying to figure out how this all fits together. Whether, whether we're trying to find a way to build bridges or we're trying to find a way to run government. Uh, the web is a great way of doing it because you can inst instantly get at other people's attempts. You can put in your little two cents worth of link. I remember very, very clearly uh, when I first encountered the World Wide Web, Mark Andreessen developed something called Mosaic, which was one of the first World Wide Web browsers. And this stunned everyone because suddenly the internet was this beautiful, colorful, interactive thing. It had never been anything like that before. One new server impressed me. It was a server of information about Rome during the Renaissance. I wandered into the music room. I clicked. I was glad I had a 21-inch color stream. Suddenly it was filled with this beautiful and illuminated score, which I could gaze at probably more easily and in more detail than I could have done had I gone to the original exhibit. It was a great example how a combination of effort from around the world could lead to fantastic things. You can now glimpse the future with nothing more than a modem, a phone line, and a few dollars a month. At this point, we're starting to see the beginnings of a new total explosion. The global village has arrived. You need a computer and a phone, and suddenly you're part of a new mesh of people, programs, archives, ideas. This thing became available called the web, and all of a sudden it was easy to get information. The democratic potential of the web was apparent right away. I was working in Washington as a public policy advocate, and people started to put the legislative proposals on the web, and all of a sudden, the disparate power over information became equalized. I could see the same information that the, the most high-priced lobbyist could see, and that was incredibly exciting. It's a completely different dimension if you enable people to not just broadcast from one central point out to many others. <laughs> but actually to start to communicate between each other you're enabling lots of people to become broadcasters and you bring down a lot of you know, traditional hierarchies that control who has access to information. In Guatemala, there are 24 different languages. The open web uh, gave the possibility for these 24 linguistic communities to start producing online radio and their own content as a way to preserve their culture. Suddenly, there is an avalanche of content being generated by ordinary people who have ideas and things that they want to share with other people. Even though they weren't getting reimbursed for it, they got gratification that something they knew was useful to somebody else. For the nerds among us, the internet and the web are a standing invitation to build that website and to build with whatever tools fit well in your hand. 
and see what bits be to pass to your door. It is the story of Netscape, and it is the story of our time. They're calling him the next Bill Gates. Hi, YouTube. This is Chad and Steve. We're the co-founders of the site. Google will pay $1.6 billion to gobble up YouTube. eBay has agreed to acquire GSI Commerce for $2.4 billion. Value between $130, $150 billion. The biggest internet IPO since Excitement Google. on the trading floor was palpable. Wall Street went bonkers. Five millionaires and billionaires were minted today. People have asked me whether I'm upset that I haven't made a lot of money from the web. In fact, I've made quite conscious decisions about which directions to lead my life. What does distress me, though, is how important a question it seems to be to some. Core in my upbringing was a value system that put monetary gain well in its place behind things like doing what I really want to do. Tim did two really important things at the very beginning of the web. Number one, he designed the web. He wrote a paper that said, here's what the World Wide Web should look like. And number two, he built an institution, the World Wide Web Consortium, that could develop and help the web to grow. If we spend a whole certain amount of time using the internet, we have to spend a little part of, a little proportion of that time defending it, worrying about it, looking out for it. What the web is becoming is a platform for collective problem solving and mass participation. We need to put in place policies that extend access for people with disabilities. So the World Wide Web Consortium is a group of companies and individuals and organizations of different types, all trying to figure out how can we make the web more powerful, how can we make it in a way more fairer, but keeping it one web. Tim certainly took care of his baby, and he really, really did. And he cares deeply that it shall end up being what he wanted it to be. For the last 25 years, whenever somebody's asked me about what the biggest, my biggest fear is, I think I've always said that some company or government or combination should end up controlling the web. The internet has always treated every customer the same, but this morning, the net neutrality principle faces a historic change. Abandoning net neutrality would threaten to end the internet as we know it. American foot net neutrality! 85% of Republican voters want net neutrality. neutrality! How would I explain net neutrality? Um, yeah, it's not very easy. <laughs> um, yes. Net neutrality. The only two words that promise more boredom in the English language are featuring sting. <laughs> People hear the word net neutrality and their eyes glaze over, 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 but this is truly important. Net neutrality is that all content travels at the same speed. It should. It's neutral. Well, and it has. It has from the beginning. The way that the web works today fits the definition of net neutrality. The web is like a highway. Anyone can circulate freely, and it doesn't matter that your car is a Ferrari, it doesn't matter that you're on a bike. There's a certain regulations just in place to keep things flowing in an efficient way. Now, think about a place where because of what you're driving, you will be forced to take a different highway that is more restricted, that has more checkpoints. That doesn't make sense, because we have one road system. It's really important you can go from anywhere to anywhere. The idea of making it dependent on what sort of car you are driving is just, just crazy. Imagine a country of 10,000 cities where you can only visit five. That's the same when you lack net neutrality. There are new fears Washington may take that wide open superhighway and turn it into a toll road. The FCC is endorsing new rules that could clear the way for a two-tier system. It would allow websites to buy faster service. The rules would open the door for the first time for Internet providers like Comcast and Verizon to charge tech companies to send content to consumers more quickly. So now people with money will have more access than people without money. Oh, and the whole idea behind the Internet in the first place was that everybody has equal access. It's not just for rich people. Everybody has access offering fast lanes and such could create a world where content providers that already are big and have big wallets 
can write checks, and those that are small might be told, you're not worth our trouble. If this had been in place all along, what innovations do you think uh, we um, wouldn't have now? I'm not sure Twitter ever gets started, because the cable company will say, Twitter, this, how's this going to make money for us? Forget it. In developing countries, it becomes critical because it can make the difference of someone living forever in ignorance and poverty to someone accessing uh, knowledge even about their rights. Russian authorities have blocked access to over 100 websites. Raif Badawi published a website promoting free speech, sometimes critical of religion. Raif Badawi was sentenced to a total of 1,000 lashes and 10 years in prison. There are lots of threats. The web has become more powerful and more powerful uh, voice of the people, more powerful an instrument. That power has been resented by some governments. A key tool for the protesters in their fight for democracy here in Hong Kong is the use of social media. We're seeing people everywhere using Twitter, using Facebook, Instagram. But there is a fear that maybe the Hong Kong government will cut reception. Nearly 40,000 websites are inaccessible in Pakistan, including YouTube. Tens of thousands of protesters marching in Hungary. They're upset about a plan by the government to tax internet use. I think things are coming to a head. The stakes are bigger than they've ever been. The rules of net neutrality, the rule that this only works because it's a neutral medium, isn't sufficiently well instilled. The World Wide Web is celebrating this month its 25th anniversary. So I've got a question for you. What sort of web do you want? We should think more about our constitutional right. It's our right, uh, in, in, in the sense of a human right, to be able to wander around the web. The web is our new world. We need to be able to go wherever we want. Let's crowdsource a Bill of Rights for the web. How about we do that? How about we decide these are, in a way, becoming fundamental rights, the right with, to communicate with whom I want? What would be on your list for that Magna Carta? <laughs> team is leading the very start of a movement to protect this public good that is the open web, because it's not too late yet. Team was the one opening this gate, this portal in time. We had a small opening uh, in our structures, and that was the web. Team opened the possibility of anyone to make anything happen on the web. Now the, the clock is ticking and this small gate in time and space is closing. When it's closed, it's closed and, and, and we will have an internet that is more similar to television, you know. It is up to us and it is difficult, but we are several millions. Do me a favor, will you uh, fight for it for me? Okay, thanks. Tim believes more than anything else that good things happen in the world when people work together. That's how he made the web happen. The debate over internet regulation has led to a record 3.7 million user comments directed at the FCC, and less than 1% of those comments were in opposition to net neutrality. They took to the streets in their tens of thousands, and their voices have been heard. Hungary has dropped plans to introduce a tax on internet use. In Mexico, the government's bid to tighten control over the use of internet is triggering anti-censorship protests. The backlash has been so intense that the country's ruling party is now backing down. The eyes have it. The Federal Communications Commission today voted three to two for net neutrality. As the outpouring from four million Americans has demonstrated, the internet is the ultimate vehicle for free expression. This is actually the third time the FCC has tried to pass net neutrality rules. They've been trying this for 12 years. In the last couple of times they've tried it, they've done it in a way that wasn't legally sustainable. We will keep emailing, we will keep writing, we will keep fighting for nothing short of real net neutrality so that it's protected forever. The openness of the internet allowed me to produce 
to build the web. The openness of the web has allowed people to build all kinds of things. We have to make sure that that kind of uh, innovation is preserved. Because I'm pretty sure there's another Tim Berners-Lee out there somewhere with some really cool idea. And there's certainly hundreds of people with slightly less cool <laughs> ideas. Uh, um, and we want to have the benefit of those ideas. You know, Rick and I have always been assailed by people who just don't get a few basic differences in this world. So we're going to settle this right now and get this all sorted out. So here we go. to figure out what you're curious about and pursue it and enjoy when it has an impact on others if you've done something interesting and worry less about whose name is being inscribed where for having done it. That seems to me one of the gifts that Tim is offering in the way in which he has handled his own role in the explosion of the web. The development of technology is as much about the users and about the way that users shape and use technology as about those lone inventors. Going forward, it will be really important for us to continue to see this as a living, breathing, growing thing. We are all responsible for this technology and we can all help shape it. I used to think I mean, the, the problems of the world, particularly now we're so global, are more than the human mind can manage. And I used to think that perhaps we would breed a more intelligent race that could solve them. But perhaps the solution is the solution of swarms. Look how clever ants are. And they haven't got much of a brain. And so we really have to be as clever as a swarm. And the web will do that. So we've got to learn to use elect collective intelligence peacefully. And a lot of problems will get solved that way. The spirit of the web was very much one of international collaboration, working together, people coding up things in the middle of the night, in the same spirit as the spirit of the Olympics. The Olympics were amazing like that. You know, there were 15,000 volunteers, huge number of them all dancing, different dances in completely different costumes, all doing their thing. They had me sitting there and typing something on the keyboard, which would be sent around the auditorium. Uh, just before we went on the stage, I said, is it okay to tweet that at the same time? It was because Tim so casually but resolutely made this uh, as he put it uh, in the line, he was asked to tweet in the middle of the Olympics with fully more than half of the viewers wondering, who is this guy? He said, this is for everyone. And he meant it. He lived it. This is for everyone. Do with it as you please. When I pressed the button, I felt I was doing it for everybody, for all the geeks that had collaborated internationally over the years. A hope in life comes from the interconnectedness of all the people in the world. The experience of seeing the web take off by the grassroots effort of thousands gives me a tremendous hope that if we have the individual will, we can collectively make of our world what we want. We are the threads holding the world together. We build it now so that those who come later will be able to create great things that we cannot ourselves imagine.